I heard it said one time, smart people learn from their mistakes. A wise person learns from other people's mistakes, right? So by following people that are ahead of you in the journey, you're gonna learn from their mistakes and you're also gonna learn from the things that they did well. Well, it's a statistically proven fact that you'll become like the three to five people you hang around. If you're around people that play small, guess what, you're gonna play small. If you want to play big, you want to be in that three to four percent like I do and like you do, you need to hang around those three to four percent people. Hi, welcome to Unwinding Opportunities with me, Ragnar. In this series, I'm talking with industry professionals on their career journeys and gain some valuable insights into their current roles and how they got there. Hope this helps you guys. So let's jump into it. And thanks for listening to Unwinding Opportunities. Hi, Alicia. How are you doing? Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Ragnar. I'm doing well. Thank you for having me today. Yeah, thank you for joining us on the podcast here today. Uh, In our last conversation, I've already learned a lot from you and some inspiration as well. So I'm really looking forward to talking more with you and get to know. So for introduction and other things, uh, can we just know where you are right now, uh, what you're doing as a director Uh, Can I get some intro so people understand your experience and what you're doing right now? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Alicia Keener, and I live on the East Coast in the United States. And I've been in the Microsoft space since 2009. I'm currently a director at a Microsoft partner. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, you're you're a director, but also the key thing for me was, uh, and in LinkedIn space, right, there are very few content creators and there are very few people who are uh, doing video side of it. There are a lot of blogs. People add a lot of value. But from you, I've learned about tip of the day. You do you provide so much uh, content out there and helping not only newcomers, but also seasoned people are learning from everything that you post. So how did you get started? What was your inspiration getting into the creation side of it? Now, that's a great question. So, you know, I actually started blogging on LinkedIn kind of on a whim. Uh, it wasn't something I planned on doing. So for years and years, I've been consulting in lots of different industries and I traveled to 14 countries. And so I've done a lot of international stuff and I just had a lot of like user guides and a lot of information. And so one day in March of 2023, I was on LinkedIn. I was like, you know what? I have like all this information, but I'm not giving it to anybody. And I'm like, why am I not like sharing with my community? And so I thought, you know what? I'm just going to start doing a tip of the day. So I did. And it really kind of, that's how it was birthed. I have always kind of wanted to blog. So in the back of my mind, I was like, oh yeah, but then I really didn't know what I'd blog about necessarily. And then I thought, you know what? If I had this question or one of my customers had this question, I'm sure there's other people out there too. And so I thought if I can make one person stay better, you know, why not? So I started blogging and since then it's really taken off and I've gotten really good responses. Yeah. One of the things I learned from you and a few other people as well, I I think I I resonate with it. Like we have a lot of knowledge out there, not only your experience, my experience or other people's experience or for whom we see on LinkedIn, but those that experiences are kind of within the people themselves or with the companies they work for. And once you move on, it kind of changes. So we we lose that kind of knowledge base that is supposed to be, uh, sh- it, it is much more valuable when shared, right? So yeah. I really appreciate you in sharing that, but also I think a lot of the community also appreciates that. But I resonate with you that we should be sharing more from our experience instead of, because people forget sometimes how much we do. And then if you don't share, you kind of forget a lot of the things. Things. Uh, but st- going by that, I think you and I, we had a, con- a conversation about consumer versus creator, right? Mm-hmm. So that's a yeah. great, I've listened to your other podcast as well, which was very, like thought process of you was very in- interesting to me. So I was also thinking here, what do you see about this consumer versus content- creator mm-hmm. aspect in LinkedIn space for especially D365? So what are your thoughts where we are now? What do you think would What do you want to encourage, maybe? Yeah, that's a great question. So I did some research about LinkedIn, and only 4% of the people on LinkedIn are actually contributors. The other people are consumers. 
And I don't know how many, I forgot the number. It's a huge number of people on LinkedIn. I don't want to misquote it, so I'm not going to quote a number, but of the mm. platforms, it's huge. So when you think only about 4% are, are actually contributing, it's really easy to start contributing on the platform and get noticed, unlike some of the other platforms where it's very concentrated and, and kind of flooded. The other thing that's good about LinkedIn is the people that are on there are actually reading the content. They're not sitting at a bus stop scrolling on their phone. So um, the studies that I read is the people that are on LinkedIn are actually doing it on their computers. So that means they're active, they're really participating, they're reading the content. Um, and I think for me, that was kind of inspiring because I'm like, if I'm going to spend the time doing this, right, you don't want somebody just to be swiping the swipe. You want them to actually get value from it. So. Yeah. The other thing also I was interested in was like you were talking something about learn from the experts, right? So you're one of the experts, yeah. you've gained this much knowledge. And I think for you providing that content, it creates that avenue for people to ask for questions or talk with you and reach yeah. out. And that's how somehow I kind of reached out to you. So and I'm thankful that you said yes. But that uh, learn from experts aspect and then and you creating this content actually saves a lot of people time and energy, right? Sometimes you might not need the video that you posted today right now, but three months down the line, I want to watch your video that you made. So uh, thank you for sharing all of that. But there is a lot of um, energy goes into this. So how are you managing your time with creating all this content tip of the day? I think it's a lot of effort from your end for I mean, there is definitely a reward, but how much of your energy is going into this and how do you manage that? Yeah, so I have a lot of documentation already, you know, from past projects and stuff like that. And of course, Microsoft's always releasing new content too. So as I run across something, you know, I'll either take notes on it or I'll read some, something on Microsoft or something like that. Um, or a client will ask me a specific question. So I don't actually spend a lot of extra time like blogging and stuff like that. I usually take content that I've already created and then I'll edit it in some way. Um, or if I do a video, I usually do one take. So I keep it short and I try not to put too much. I try not to overthink it too mm -hmm. much um, because the thing is a lot of business people like us, we don't want to sit and watch a 20 minute video. We really want to know how do you do this specific thing? Um, so that's really what I try to do when I do my videos or do my blogs. But in all fairness, I also do that for my own benefit because I forget. Yeah. Like I go back and watch my own content or read my own blogs a lot because like, oh my goodness, I have this mental marker. Like I know I did this before, but I don't remember the details. So I'll go back and, and do that. So I think the key to our listeners today is to understand that you have information that I don't have. So if you post it or you blog about it, then other people are going to benefit from it. Or even if, say, someone else has already blogged about it, maybe they're not in your circle of influence. Or maybe you're going to say it slightly differently than I would. So I would encourage people just to kind of put themselves out there um, because, again, with, collectively we can grow and become a stronger community. Yeah. No, thank you. I mean, before we jump into your technical aspects, one of the key things that inspiring for me was like, you came from marketing background and yeah. and other finance, right? but now you're on the life sciences and D365 space. And I think if someone's in not thinking about Fender or other things, I think that would be inspirational for people to know about your journey. So can we just go back a few years, maybe? <laughs> and see yeah. how your journey started into and how you got into FNO because you started your own company at some point as well. So we would love to know uh, that side of it and you could be inspiring for someone who's not in FNO now maybe. You know, right now, I really believe that everything happens for a reason. And so lots of times we get in circumstances or in conversations or we have ideas about things and we start to pursue them, not even really know where, where it's going to go. And so like for me, I remember I was a, so after I'd finished my freshman year of college, I was sitting in summer school because I was getting ahead and taking semester extra classes during the summer. And I'm like, you know, I'm 18 years old at this point. I'm like, nobody's going to hire me with a marketing degree if I don't have experience. And so I was sitting in macroeconomics uh, in July and someone had posted a job for a marketing student to work in a local office. Well, little did I know that that office would be a consulting firm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that, I didn't even know what consulting was at that point in my life. So I was like, hey, it's a job. You know, it's going to give me some good, you know, something good to put on my resume. 
having no idea that I'd be sitting here all these years later being, you know, a professional consultant. And so I took the, took the job. And when I graduated from college, you're like, Hey, do you want to maybe be a consultant? Do you want to do these things? And so I was like, sure, why not? Right. I mean, I got to travel and I worked on projects in Turkey and Canada and out Mexico and El Salvador and Puerto Rico and all of the United States. And, um, I was really ambitious. So whatever, somebody wanted me to do, I did it. So I learned manufacturing really, really well. And uh, piece rate uh, stuff, payroll, order to cash, procure to pay. Um, and so I got tons of experience. And so after doing that for 15 years, I left that company and started my own company okay. called Ion ERP Inc. And at that point, I became the customer for the first time because the company I was working for did not resell their software through distributors. So I was like, okay, let's go find software. And I'm thinking, this isn't going to be hard. I know what questions to ask. I know who to talk to and all these kinds of things. But what I quickly found was it was hard. It is so hard. <laughs> I knew what questions to ask. I knew who my target market was. And I started talking to people like, hey, you know, how does this sort of work? What are your price point and stuff? So I went through an, emo an emotional journey that I didn't expect. So being in this client's chair, being in the customer seat for the first time was really hard. Uh, but I'm really, really grateful for that, that pain and that, that struggle that I went through. Because now when I'm sitting on a sales cycle with a potential client, I can feel some of those emotions. I can feel some of those fears. I can feel some of those the risk, right? Because at the end of the day, what if you pick the wrong software? Yeah. You're putting all this money, all this time, all this energy into this basket. What if it's not the right fit? And so having going through that journey, I think was really, really helpful for me. So in 2009, I got multiple, I chose to go with Microsoft Dynamics 2009, uh, which okay. is now D365 FNSC. So, um, that began my journey on Microsoft. And so then I started, you know, getting really involved on the finance side of things. And of course, kept up with manufacturing as well. And I did that for about five years. And then the guy that hired me at my first job, his name was Marty, um, mm -hmm. called me up out of the blue and said, hey, Alicia, I had this project with Free Delay. You know, would you be interested in doing this project? So um, we met, long story short, um, he hired me and I became uh, responsible for the free to lay account uh, for his company, and it was an enterprise asset management project. Okay. So free to lay free to lay has twenty two thousand trucks. They're the seventh largest fleet in North America, and so I did that for about thirteen months. And the guy I was working with as a freelancer on Microsoft kept on pinging me. He's like, "Hey Alicia, hey Alicia, will you come back? You know, will you do this?" And so I was like, "Hey John, you know, give me an answer, give me an offer. I can't say no to." And so he did. So I became a director of finance for Microsoft Gold Partner, okay. and uh, which was a lot of fun. And then I left there and I went to another firm and were, was a program manager for a very, very large account. Um, you know, we did some rapid implementations over a period of four years and um, set up some shared services in Canada and the United States. And then I came to my current role, and I'm a director for life sciences on the delivery team for FNSC. Okay, that's amazing. I mean, one of the key things is people forget, uh, like, I know you joined in 2009 with the AX journey, but also looking at you, you never meant to be falling into a fendo space or something. It just organically happened. And, and now you are like leading the implementations and others. So it's a great journey, I would say. Um, but also, I was also thinking, uh, like currently the barrier to entry has been changing, right? So before you need to be, in AX sometimes you had to be much more, you need to have some technical skill or accounting skill, but now you could learn the, things have changed. So I was thinking, what are your tips on people who are thinking to enter f and space maybe? Mm -hmm. The barrier to, entries, barrier to entry has been changing even with the new AI stuff, low code, no code. So maybe some tips that people who are interested in joining maybe would be interested do you have any yeah. tips for those guys and even myself yeah no absolutely I think it's one of those things you have to figure out what gives you energy so mm -hmm. when you're working with because again software consulting is a people business so you're in the people business and unless you're like a developer and even then you're typically exposed you know you're working with the, the functional consultants and sometimes a client directly as well so I think you have to figure out what gives you energy is it 
you know, being on the sales side? Is it being on supply chain or finance or doing some kind of coding or power apps or AI, those kinds of things? And then I think once you find out what you enjoy, like what gives you energy, where you feel that reward from, then I think you start getting really good at it. So I think it's a lot of people feel like they have to swallow the whole watermelon at one time. Yeah. You can't do that because then you become an expert at nothing and you kind of become a generalist and you're really not good at any of it. So I would recommend finding your niche, finding out what gives you energy where you can add value um, and then really get good at that and then start marketing yourself in that way. So anytime you want to start looking at your market, you want to look, work towards your bullseye. Yeah. You want to say, hey, who is my target customer? So once you learn that, um, then you can start perfecting your skills and going after those particular parts of the industry or markets that you're in. And then your, your, your target will grow as you get more experienced. Um, but yeah, find out what, what gives you energy, what you enjoy, and then just get really good at that. Yeah. No, I agree. I think it's the client relationship and advi advice, right? So basically, we're building that client relationship and then the yeah. advice. In here, may, maybe I'm thinking like if I'm a client or if a company wants to reach out to you for a solution and stuff, yeah. I think you are a great person to reach out. So I was thinking, uh, what advice would you give to companies looking to strengthen their client mm -hmm. advisory relationship, right? With experts like you and others. It's not always you have to go to the you go to big companies, but sometimes you don't know whom you're working with. But looking at your profile and stuff, I think people, I would be interested in learning from you and knowing about that uh, dynamics, right? So can you give some tips on uh, importance of building that relationship and how they can reach you and what is what are your interests in meeting new clients or companies? Yeah, absolutely. So whenever you're working with a client, it's important for it to be a partnership. Yeah. It has to be an us statement, not an us versus them situation. It has to be a win-win. So when you go into a company, they're going to start telling you lots of times what their pain points are and those kinds of things, which is great. But what you want to do as a consultant and when you're building that relationship, you want to say, what is your business objective? Where are you today and where do you want to go? Because once you start understanding their vision and you start understanding their passion and you understand who their customers are and who they're serving, it'll put you into a totally different frame of mind because the, the, Microsoft is just a tool. So the tool is meant to be used as a tool to help you advance what you want to do. So you always want to start with the business side because a client needs to know that they've been seen, they've been heard, and they've been understood. And then based upon that, once you really get your hands wrapped around that, then you become part of their thought process and can help them accomplish the goal that they're actually looking to achieve. Okay. No, that's that's like great advice as well. On the other hand, I was also thinking some advice in uh, maybe picking the right implementation partner. I think solution oh, picking the right solution is a key thing, I guess. But with your experience, you have implemented almost in 14 countries so far with the cultural change and stuff. I mm -hmm. was thinking any advice that you have for um, managers, CFOs who are trying to look for implementation partners, uh, any suggestions on that end, please? Yeah, so whenever you look at the, at the statistics, 50% of ERP implementations are deemed unsuccessful. Yeah. Yikes, right? That's so when number, you step yeah. back from that and you start asking why, right? Why is that number so big? And I think you have to put it in context of the importance of ERP. So ERP, your enterprise writing and planning, is part is the heartbeat of your business. All of your data, right, is being pushed through this. So it's like the heart of your business. So whenever you replace that ERP system, you're really doing like heart surgery on your business. But yeah. guess what? You can't stop. So it's like you're running this marathon doing heart surgery at the same time. So as a result of that, there's a lot of risk. There's a lot of risk wrapped around it. So if I were to advise a company that's looking for an ERP system, you absolutely must pick the right partner. Yeah. And how you do that, the key to that is making sure that your partner is one, a partner. Some companies just want to get in and get out, get in and get out. There's no relationship. It's very like mechanical. It's like, oh, give me your data. We're going to kind of force it into this, this box. And they really don't take time to say, why? Why are you doing this business process? What are you trying to accomplish? What is your business objective? And if they don't have that conversation, 
nine chances out of 10, you're not gonna be happy with your imp implementation because it is so, so critical to understand the why and then the action that to get to, to that piece of it. The other thing you wanna do is make sure you pick someone that's in your industry. Yeah. There are certain things around life sciences that you have to deal with GXP compliances, there's FDA compliances, there's different things that you have to be aware of to make sure that you're in compliant with those regulatory agent agencies. So definitely pick someone in your line of business, make sure it's a partner and not just somebody you're gonna, you know, do the implementation, get in, get out. And then also make sure that they are willing to help you look at your business holistically. So if someone comes in and says, hey, I just want to replace my, my, finan my, my finances, that's great. And we're going to talk about your finances, but I need to kind of get a bigger handle on what your business is trying to accomplish. Because once we understand what your business is doing, then we're going to set up your financial reporting reports differently. We may set up your financial dimensions or a chart of account structures differently. So you want to really make sure that someone has the skill set in your industry and the fortitude to, to dig a bit deeper to get out of that surface level. The third thing I would say is pick a partner that's gonna help you mitigate risk. So to mitigate risk, it comes down to implement, implementation methodology. What mechanisms and what checkpoints do you have in your implementation process to ensure quality and also ensure that you're not gonna fail? So make sure you have the right documentation for your solution verification, for your UAT, for your mock, for your go live, to make sure your system is actually going to start up and work efficiently right out of the gates. No, those are some great advices. And I, I feel like anyone new starting with f and it's uh, uh, that's where kind of that you mentioned, like 50% of the projects, they have some kind of hurdle or fail or something like that, right? But what I have noticed to piggyback on your key things is a lot of the times I've been in interviews or trying to reach these partners, they are stressing more on like, can we get this by this end date? Can we get this by this timeline? People concentrate on approving projects based on the end date and timeline, but that's not how you should look at a project, especially for something like ERP. Like you said, it's definitely an open heart surgery kind of a thing. You need to keep your business running, and then suddenly you need to have a cutoff date, and then you have to move into the next one, bringing all your balances, all your... Uh, transactions, open transactions, uh, that's not going to happen within an hour or two for a cutoff timeline, right? So keeping those things is something I've learned. And yeah, I would add those two things maybe, uh, but uh, but I'll talk more about that and then maybe we can learn more. Uh, in your global implementations, right, in FN, even in USA, I'm seeing in different industry, there is a different way of implementing certain things. So for your like there is some cultural sensitivity as well because especially people in finance are very kind of stubborn with certain rules and standards. So I was thinking you having led so many implementations across various countries, uh, how do you manage cultural differences uh, and how do you ensure smooth integration with systems with uh, other environments, but also within the company culture? So can you can you give us your insight as a director uh, and how you have done it so far? Yeah, so when you deal with different countries, one, there's different regulatory requirements, like France, for example, has their statutory chart of accounts and some different things. You also have to deal with tax, so value-added tax, VAT. Um, there's some different type of regulatory uh, pieces that, that you need to keep in, in touch with. The other thing is, like you mentioned, the cultural side of things. Like if you're doing business in, say, Mexico, Puerto Rico versus England or something like that, very different cultures, very different cultures. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and it's not that one's good and one's bad. They're just different. Um, so you have to really kind of pay attention to those things. And at the end of the day, you have to find out what's important to your client. So in some places you'll go into and, every, you know, everything's urgent. The house is on fire. We got to have this done tomorrow. And then you'll provide it to them and then they don't touch it for, you know, two months. So there's, there's some kind of agreements you have to come to. So the way you write your statements of work sometimes is worded a bit differently. Yeah. So the expectations sometimes are a bit different. Um, so it kind of depends on where you're at. But at the end of the day, each company is a bit individual, so just because they happen to be in a certain country doesn't mean they're all going to be that way. Yeah. So it's not like, um, you know, I remember the first time I worked on a project in El Salvador, I showed up 
to the room and I was like, you know, I had everything ready. I was ready to go and no one was there. And I was like, what just happened? <laughs> and I'm like, am I in the wrong room? And then what I found out was no. So I asked like, am I in the right room? I went and found someone. And they said, no, they're, they're coming. And sure enough, within an hour, period of an hour, they trinkled in. <laughs> and we had our meeting. So, again, I'm sure not all companies, you know, are like that. Uh, but there are certain characteristics. Having known that now, having had that experience, I would have a conversation with the project manager or, the you know, the, the whoever my report, I would report to and say, hey, what is the expectation within your company? So I think one of the big things that I've learned working in different cultures is you just ask the question, you know, it's not confrontational, it's not good or bad, it's just like, what is the expectation so that I can adapt to meet the requirements of that particular culture? Okay, the next question I was thinking, it's not your question in a way, I'm learning from you, so this is great conversation and information for me, but I was thinking, uh, you're, you are in life sciences now, I know you have experiences in other places too, but uh, life sciences and insurance and other things, they have different, uh, what do you call pain points in those industry? So I was thinking if someone from life sciences is listening to you, maybe yeah. if you can help help us with some uh, common pain points in life science companies, such as data integrity, uh, regulatory and other things, uh, what mm -hmm. strategies do you recommend uh, for addressing these kinds of challenges? So with your experience, people might be able to learn from that. One of the big things in life science is your GXP compliances. So, and I used to think, well, what is GXP? It sounds so fancy. It's a GXP just means for good X, whatever you want to put in the blank, practice. That's all it means. So it could be good data practice, good manufacturing practice, good whatever you want to put in the blank. But in the life science business, it's super, super important to be able to do traceability. So if you were to create a pharmaceutical you know, drug, or if you were to have a certain medical device, you have to be able to track that either with a serial number or a batch number. We typically use batch number in FNSC because you can do batch tracing. Um, there's also some ISVs that we currently are going to start working with to do advanced tracing. Um, so because if there's a recall or if there's a failure at any point, you have to be able to trace it back to its source. So that way you can do a recall if necessary and those kinds of things. Um, the other thing is you have to have a lot of, for regulatory purposes, you have to document your business processes and procedures, your SOPs, your, your standard operating procedures, and have those like signed off on by a quality person. So when we deal with life science projects, we talk to the quality person at that client a lot um, and the regulatory person to make sure that we're in compliance um, with that. So, I mean, really at the end of the day, there's the biggest difference I've seen between life sciences and, and other industries is there's a lot more control. Like they like to do engineering change management. So that way somebody has to sign off the bill, bill of material change is indeed approved. You know, approved vendor list when you're on the release products, right? Those kinds of things. There's a lot more controls um, that are kind of built around it that I've seen inside of life sciences and post uh, other yeah. industries. Thank you. Yeah, not that you'll only do life sciences, but uh, having that specialization now, I thought if someone's in life sciences, I worked in life sciences for a while now, uh, like almost most of my experience is in a pharmaceutical side of it, right? So, uh, but uh, those are some great insights and thank you. And and those are kind of similar to any industry in a way, but they're key in this industry. And yeah. One, one of the things too to add there, there's a lot of R&D or research and development inside of life sciences. So even they may, even though they have a product that they've commercialized or gone to market with, they're always trying to find new ways to either take that particular drug or something and put it into a different market, or maybe that drug could be used for a different medical purpose, or they're trying to improve their medical device if it's a if it's a device or something like that. So costing becomes a big deal um, because you do need to keep track of those R&D costs so that way you can account for those properly in your financials and you also get tax benefits uh, from most countries around R&D type um, activities and stuff. So costing and finance gets kind of scrutinized at a different level in life sciences in some ways for that. Yeah. And also in life sciences, like especially during the COVID time, I was in the industry where we were creating 
like testing kits and stuff. So suddenly you get the an amount of orders increase at a drastic level. And there's a new products. You don't know what's happening. The forecasting side, you need to work much more because the uh, the whole aspect of forecasting, that that thing kind of gets into, okay, how much do we need to buy? How much do we need to manufacture? Get from which vendor at what time? Because healthcare, it's all about timing too, right? So you cannot send a product one week late. If someone needs it today, they need it today. Uh, right. So, But that's great. Um, and the next topic I was thinking was maybe as we went into cultural cultural thing uh, we touched a bit there but erp space is always evolving it's never mm -hmm. stable so yeah. you know that we have to do our keep up with the updates and stuff so have you seen any uh, questions or issues regarding companies not understanding that change in business strategy of okay this product is an evolving product it's not that i implement today and i'm done for next three years right you have to keep working on it every year certain times mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's another point about life sciences. You can't just run an update in, in prod because it has to be, you know, has to be go through quality again. So they have to make sure that their processes are tested and stuff like that. I know other industries do that too, but specifically in life science, it becomes like a regulatory yeah. kind of thing. So during the sales cycle, we have those conversations. We tell them that Microsoft is a, is a SaaS, a software as a service. And you can only skip so many updates before you have to take it. So you're not going to be sitting on the same version for, you know, more than a year. Um, and most companies are okay with that, but it does mean that they have to plan a bit more and they have to anticipate getting those releases put into a test environment and tested. So there's a different level of ownership wrapped around that versus, you know, having an on-prem type software solution. Yeah. No, thank you. And the other thing I was also thinking was, as you have been seen seen some changes from AX to FNO, and now oh. FNO coming up with everything, Microsoft adds Copilot to it. So, yeah. just a fun question, maybe. What any future trends and predictions you have in the, the FNO space? What are you looking forward to, maybe? You know, I've thought about the whole AI component inside of FNO, and. It, there's a part of me that thinks that it could be really fantastic, you know, as far as like analyzing sales data or analyzing quality data or analyzing different pieces of data. But I still feel like I can't quite wrap my hands around the how yeah. because of the way the data stored. It's not like if you were to set up your ERP system, you may set it up differently than mine. So I'm still kind of trying to wrap my head, my head around the how behind it. But I think yeah. there's something definitely there. Because it would be nice to know, like, do some kind of analysis, like which customers are paying late or how, which vendors, you know, are having quality issues sending us stuff. Because one of the things when you go into a business, you always have money makers and money takers. So what I mean by that is you'll have different types of customers and for different items, there's some items that you're going to make a good profit margin on with some customers and other customers, they're kind of a, more of a money taker. It's almost like because they're a big customer, because they have some footprint or some impact that you want to have, you're willing to take a smaller profit margin on them. So just because you're shipping them a lot of product doesn't mean you're making a lot of money on them, right? And then there's other customers where you may not ship to them that often, but you have really nice profit margins, so you're actually making a lot of money. Sure. So I always ask customers that, like, do you know who your money makers are and your money takers are? And I think that's a place where like Power BI could come in and play really helpful through, or the AI piece of it actually yeah. could come in really helpful to help do like analysis on stuff like that. So I'm, I'm really kind of yeah. eager to see, see how uh, it all Today is out. the Microsoft Ignite, right? So I'm kind yeah. of waiting to see what's happening. Right. I have a few things scheduled and I'm waiting on that. But yeah, no, that makes, even I'm in the same boat. I know all these AI pieces. I've watched the open AI stuff and I'm trying to make content around it, but I'm pretty sure if you find a trend or something, you'll make a video on it. So uh, I'm looking forward to that tip of the day from you. Uh, <laughs> but uh, on the other side, so, I mean, career success technology is not just who you are in a way. <laughs> You've grown to be with other skills as well. So mm -hmm. I just want to just step back and get to know a bit more about like, what are your other hobbies and stuff that you have? <laughs> Maybe we can le learn more about you than just watching you every day kind of on your video. <laughs> You know, it's so funny because I, I really, really enjoy working. Like, I absolutely love what I do. And I think that's probably why 
blogging and stuff like that kind of comes natural to me. Uh, one of the things I do is I read a lot. Yeah. So um, I'm constantly reading stuff about health and, you know, um, just different things for like quality of life or self-help or coaching and stuff like that. I'm a mom yeah. as well. So I keep up with my, with my kids um, and stuff like that. So, but I'm going to be an empty nester um, probably in the next couple of years. So it's one of those kinds of things. It's like, okay, well, what am I going to do? And I don't have to keep up with my kids and those kinds of things. So there's some hobbies that I would like to kind of fall back on that I used to do more than what I do now. Um, I used to be a pretty good piano player, so mm -hmm. I'd like to take that back up again. Um, I had my black belt in Taekwondo mm -hmm. that I got in my 20s. There's a story behind that, by the way. I got followed at night at an airport, and I'm like, never again. So mm -hmm. after that, I came home and signed up for karate. <laughs> so, um, so I'd like to pick that up back up again. Um, I used to know enough French to get around, enough Spanish to get around. But um, so I'd like to dabble in the language bit a, a little bit more. So, no, I mean, that's the other like I like to learn about people in that aspect, too, because uh, yeah. they're just not one thing. Right. We are we are amalgamation of a lot of things. And mm -hmm. like you said, you and also like you saying you learn karate for something to be strong. It kind of re reflects on your business, too. You don't you don't just take it as a. Uh, thing to worry about you take care of it you 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 put some effort into making sure you're uh, you're taken care if there is anything but i hope never that happens and you never have to <laughs> use it <laughs> but uh, but piano sounds great like uh, that's amazing maybe you can add your own music to your videos later <laughs> Maybe I never thought of that. That's that's true. <laughs> Maybe you could have an introduction. I'm also learning a bit about like, do people want to see? But I think people want to relate to you. I think people, a lot of people, yeah. can relate. You being a mom, you being the business leader, you being uh, interested in like you used to play. I think languages and other things. Those are all key things that make who we are and. People would love to relate to you in those levels. I think everyone's, even I used to do a lot of things before and I recently got married and I'm, I'm like, yeah. okay, I cannot be on editing a video after 7 p.m., right? <laughs> so. I know. You know, I think you go through different stages of life. You know, before you get married, you know, you feel like you don't have any time, but you, but you, you really feel like, realize you have tons of time and then you get, you know, and then you get married and then you have kids and it's just your world just, you know, just changes and, and in a good way. I mean, it, it's one of those things, but you don't have time to do the hobbies and, you know, things because your focus is a bit different. Yeah. Um, and, and it should be, you know, I mean, that's, that's part of stages of life and stuff. So it's all good. I think it's a great inspiration. I think people, one of the key things I'm also looking is I see a lot of great content creators, both men and women now in the space. And it's it's been nice to see that kind of mix and uh, I'm I'm happy to like inspire from you as much as from other people. Yeah, so that's a great thing. And I think everyone has a timeline, right? So you got to start making just in March, but I've seen like your progress has been great in terms of uh, uh, reaching out to the community and getting that content up, providing to them. So I think that's great. Uh, the other one I was thinking was, Maybe there are some aspiring professionals or something. So for individuals who are aspiring to excel in either f and or even any technology or life or, or other things, right? What kind of key skills and mindset do you think are essential for their success in this age in a way? Because we're in 2024 almost. So yeah. I think that could be a great thing to learn from you. Well, it's a statistically proven fact that you'll become like the three to five people you hang around. Let that sink in for a minute. The three to five people you hang around. Now, that doesn't even mean people in person. Those could be influencers that you follow on Instagram or Facebook or LinkedIn or YouTube. Who are you letting influence your thought process? Yeah. Because whatever you focus on, whatever you put your time to is what will expand in your world. So if you're going to, if you want to be worried about, you know, worried about things, watch the news all the time, right? You're instinctively going to saturate your thought process with all this fear. If you want to become more money savvy, start following people that have already been there ahead of you and doing those things. If you want to become more like a life coach, start listening to people that are life coaches. So like for me personally, I'm very, very funny about who I follow 
um, my, on social media. I'm very funny about who I let into my circle because I know they're going to influence me. Yeah. So I think if you want to change who you are today, you change who you put yourself around. If you're around people that play small, guess what? You're going to play small. If you want to play big, you want to be in that three to four percent like I do and like you do. Yeah. You need to hang around those three to four percent people. Right. That's how you change who you are. If you want to be a person of hope and encouragement and faith, follow those people. Start learning from them, because I heard it said one time, smart people learn from their mistakes. A wise person learns from other people's mistakes. Yeah. Right. So by following people that are ahead of you in the journey, you're going to learn from their mistakes and you're also going to learn from the things that they did well. So it's going to prevent you or at least make you cognitive or aware of those things so that you can help, you know, with your journey and your trajectory and learning from those people. No. Yeah, I'm a big proponent of that, too. I think people always worry about like, hey, I'm from a small town or I don't have opportunities. But the thing is, we are living in a different age now where you can follow someone outside of your completely different zone and then you can influence by that. And yeah, I would love to be one of the five people in your circle so I can learn from you in a way. But uh, that's something people kind of forget every day is about, even if you read books, sometimes people don't realize, I have read so many books at my when I'm young, they were just like I was finishing a book in a way. But now as I grow old, those books are kind of like my backbone in a way. Like people yeah. don't understand that those kind of pillars that you read might not have no meaning to you then, mm -hmm. right? But like it's, yeah. you have, you're building all these pillars. Yeah. You never know till the landslide happens that, oh, you have a strong, strong foundation in a way. So yeah, I agree with that. And then I think people also should uh, learn from other mistakes that you said is, also, you should just follow people who are growing, who are just starting mm -hmm. as well, because mm -hmm. you can, you, like for me, I want to learn from your journey for a few, from March you started, right? I've already mm -hmm. seen you've done so many videos, and even in the first conversation, I've learned about me overthinking too many things, but you gave me a great insight. Uh, I think talking is also other thing people miss. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. that's one of the whole reason for me to do this podcast is I would love to talk to people because they are not just uh, someone just talking and showing a screen, right? They have a lot more to offer you than just the technology. So yeah. thank and you for that. Yeah. I think it's important too to know that your journey isn't always an upward climb. I mean, you're going to go through peaks and valleys and peaks and valleys. What you want to do as an individual, as long as you're on an upward trajectory, like you're not, that's all you're caring about because you're, no one's journey is going to start at point A and you're going to shoot up, you know, in, in a constant flow. Because I think what happens, sometimes people will be on their journey and then something bad will happen and then they totally knock them off because they're, they, you know, and then they don't really know how to get back into that. Because I can tell you like on my journey, I've had lots of like peaks and valleys and sometimes, um, you really don't know what to do with it. I remember the first time I was probably well, maybe 28 at the time. I remember I woke up one day and I felt like I knew nothing. And I was like, wait a minute, what just happened to me? Because I remember thinking like, I knew what I was doing and now I feel like I don't know anything. And it was really, it was a very kind of odd moment in my life. But what I realized, what I realized was I was starting to realize what I didn't know. Yeah. Right now, all of a sudden, something had happened and it kind of opened up my mind. I'm like, oh, there's a whole new world out there. So sometimes as you're going through these ups and downs, what you perceive as being a down or something bad or whatever, it's just because another door's opening. Yeah. So it's one of those kinds of things you have to look at it and say, don't necessarily be say, why is it happening? But what am I supposed to do with what's happening? And that'll keep, keep you in that growth mindset. Um, and I think for me personally, that's been, you know, a, a key thing. The other part of it is that sometimes you think when people get to a certain age or they get to a certain level, that somehow they just coast, like they just have it all together and it just um, everything just magically works out for them. It's not true. What happens is, though, you learn how to deal with the ups and downs differently because you see them. You actually now like, oh, this is happening, and so I need to do X, Y, Z. So you kind of, it's really important as an individual to start understanding or observing your ups and downs and then learning from them and figuring out what they're leading you towards. Because they're actually there for a reason. 
They're there to push you into a different trajectory or a different path. So look at them as opportunities. Whenever something seemingly bad happens, look, look at, try to find the opportunity in it. And um, it'll change the way you, it'll change your journey. Yeah. I'd say. It has for me. No, I believe in that too. And also like sometimes right now is one of the great examples is you saying this is like, this is the other side of you that I would not have known if I don't have this conversation, right? And even for me, it's not from my own words. I'm reading this book called like The Diary of the CEO or whatever. Oh, nice. And uh-huh. in this, like one of the key things I was reading yesterday was the first step before anybody else believes in you is you have to believe in yourself. Yeah. And it's like you said, it's not only about journey. Sometimes you have to act like where you want to be, mm-hmm. right? Because if I believe in that, I'm going to be able to interview people and learn from them. I have to mm-hmm. believe in myself that I'm going to gain something out of this. Yeah. I can never look at this as like, oh, why would people want to talk to me? Once I start believing in myself, that's when I got to reach out to you and a few other people. And mm-hmm. once we talk, I think... As a key thing is people who are aspiring to be, the other people who aspire and grow or have been successful, they see that in other people. Like I think one of the reasons you said yes is you saw something that is valuable for your time as well. So I really appreciate (laughs) that. Uh, But uh, I think that's what I would say people is just believe in yourself first and then Mm -hmm. follow the journey like Alicia said. Uh, But also sometimes you have to take the leap of faith and put Sometimes the old saying is don't put all your eggs in one basket. But mm-hmm. some, now in nowadays, you just have to put everything in. Sometimes, if not, you cannot just float on two kayaks, right? You have to be in one or the other. Yeah, uh, and the perfect true. time will never come. <laughs> I, I, right. I have that's very limited, I'm not that old, but I have very limited experience. But I've always learned if I wait for the perfect time, it's always going to be it next never happens. It's never yeah. happens. Yeah. I think the other thing that's really kind of inspired me is I truly believe that each person was born, born on purpose for a purpose. Yeah. Right? Like you were born on purpose for a purpose. I was born on purpose for a purpose. Each of us has a role to play. Yeah. And I think that and your purpose can shift throughout your life. But whenever you look at your work, like when I look at my work, I feel like I'm living out my purpose. Yeah. My why is really big. Like the why, the reason I do what I do is 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 big. And because of that, whenever I, I lean into that and it gives me energy, it gives me faith, it gives me opportunity and all of that. So I'm not just going through the motions and I'm not trying to get rich. I'm trying to live out the purpose that was that I was born to do. And I find that very, very inspiring. And I feel like that because I have a purpose, that whatever skills I need, I'll end up having those skills when I need them yeah. because I'm here to live out that purpose and I'm not giving, I wasn't put on this earth empty handed. And so, you know, people and opportunities will come into my life um, when they need to so that I can fulfill that purpose. No, that's great. I think the key thing there is besides the purpose is your purpose changes at different stages of your life. And then as long as you try to move towards a purpose, you will evolve and find the best purpose for that time of your life or your friend's life or your whomever you're trying to help or whoever is trying to look for, into your life and get inspiration. So, no, uh, I agree and thank you so much. I mean, this is the other thing I'm also always interested in is Sometimes I felt like I had no, I don't know what the purpose of the channel should be. But yesterday when I was speaking to you, you gave me that idea like, you know what, you talk to people and you enjoy it, then you should just do it. Don't overthink, just create the video uh, and then it will help you and help me discover what I want to be as well. Um, I think people don't understand. People always want what is the purpose instead of saying I should discover what the purpose has to be. Sometimes you have to put in some work. Exactly. And you know that by what gives you energy, yeah. like part of how you figure out what your purpose is. There's certain tasks that I can do that I get so energized by. I could just literally do it all day long. And there's other things that I can do that literally drain me. I mean, like deplete me. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh. so those are things. That's how you can kind of figure out, I would say, what your purpose is or what your calling is, is listen to your body, listen to your soul. Like what and why does it make me feel that way? And once you start listening to your soul and you'll, you'll start to find out pretty fast, like, wow, that really gave me a lot of energy. And those are the things you need to lean into. Yeah. 
No, and the other thing is, I was also like, let's switch back to some of the career aspect because I think people on LinkedIn want to know that aspect of it. You've been awarded like the Microsoft Partner Year of the Award, and that's amazing. And I also like, do you have any goals towards MVP or something you're working towards? I wish, I would love for you to get that, but uh, I'm just thinking, are there some aspirations in your career that are in next phases, maybe in a couple of months or something? Yeah, absolutely. So when I started my blogging, I really didn't have MVP in my scopes. But then once I started doing it and started getting a lot of, you know, uh, followers and traction and stuff, I'm like, you know what, why not? Like, why, why shouldn't I be MVP? So I've started focusing on that. I've done a couple of speaking events and, of course, my you know, video blogs and, and written blogs as well. So my goal is to submit my application for MVP in January. Okay. Um, so I would love to to do that and become part of the the MVP team. MVP so. teams. I think, uh, yeah, I think I've seen one of your other uh, episode other than your YouTube maybe. But yeah, I think that's, uh, that's a great goal because a lot of the times people have to have some other thing to move forward, right? But uh, I know you do these things without any... Uh, reward associated with them but I really feel like you can achieve that and I think you deserve that in a certain aspect from what I have learned so far right you're adding value to the community Um, and uh, just looking at that side of it I was also thinking as a as you have so much content that you're providing Uh, so for our listeners uh, I will put some notes on where they can find you but uh, what are some avenues or what what do you think about um, insights about your work and what you're doing, where they can follow other than uh, maybe just LinkedIn is the best place to start. Is that how Yeah, so I'm on LinkedIn. Um, so Alicia Keener, um, I'm on LinkedIn. Also, um, I have my website, aliciakeener.com. Okay. Um, the other URL for that is intracloudynamics.com. So okay. aliciakeener.com or intracloudynamics.com will take you to to my website. So Okay. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I follow you. I think anyone who's watching on the LinkedIn will definitely follow you. But it's someone who wants to get inspired from YouTube land. I just wanted that to be in there. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think the conversation has been very helpful for both um, F&O side, but also someone inspiring. So I really appreciate you jumping in and giving a lot of your time. So are there any ending thoughts or something that you want to say to the audience? Yeah, yeah, thank you for for having me, Ragnar. It's been a pleasure being here. And truly, if nothing else comes from this and comes from my blogs and all of that, I hope that you feel inspired. I hope you look at someone like me and say, if she can do it, I can do it too. Because really, at the end of the day, that's why I do what I do, is to inspire other people to say, hey, keep it simple, do what you do best, find your voice, because the world needs to hear your voice. So I, that's that's really what I want the takeaway to be from this is to inspire other people to put their knowledge on LinkedIn and other blogs and, and sites and become part of the community. Yeah. Uh, and to end this, I would also say reach out to Alicia. She's very active on LinkedIn. Uh, if you have any questions or want to create content or anything related to f or even technology, she's a great person to learn from. Uh, and she was very helpful and thankful for joining here. So thank you, Alicia. We'll see you soon. And maybe next time we talk on other things. But uh, appreciate your time. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you.